Um, today we have with us Dr. Allison Bateman House, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at um, NYU in their division of medical ethics. Dr. Bateman House completed her undergraduate degree in anthropology from the University of Virginia, from which she also received a master's degree in bioethics, her first of three master's degrees, I might say. She then received an MPH and an MPhil um, from Columbia University and her PhD from Columbia in sociomedical sciences and history. Her PhD dissertation was called Compelled to Volunteer, American Conscientious Objectors to World War II as Subjects of Medical Research, really interesting work. Um, and at Columbia, she worked on many, many different um, uh, research projects with various faculty there in ethics and history at the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. She has published on conscientious Objector, objectors in medical research, on bicycle helmets in public health, on obesity, politics, and ethics, and has been conducting significant work while she's been at NYU on access to investigational drugs, which is what she's going to talk about today. The title of her talk is Individual Pleas, Public Interests, The Dilemma of Compassionate Use. So welcome, and we're glad you're here. Thank you. I will try to project, but um, can you hear me in the back of the room? Yes. Jeremy says no. Can you hear me now? <laughs> You're doing great. Okay, thank you. Um, so Nancy just saved me having to go through most of this first slide. Um, but I will flag before I begin that this talk um, is based on work I do at the NYU Working Group on Compassionate Use, which is a multidisciplinary group that I co-chair with Art Kaplan. Um, and basically, uh, it grew out of a case that I'm going to talk about with y'all today. But uh, it has developed into a very vibrant program of activity dealing with issues of access to investigational drugs. And just to flag some of the people that you may recognize their names of who are on this group. In addition to Art Kaplan, uh, Nancy Dubler, and Skip Nelson, who's at the NIH, are all members of this working group. So um, next time you see them, you can talk to them about what we've been doing. So just to get some preliminaries out of the way, I have a disclosure slide I need to do. I want to define a few terms, and then uh, just to make sure it's crystal clear, I'm going to give you my argument up front, and then I'm going to go into a case in which I want to uh, try to flesh out that argument. So my disclosures are that I'm a consultant to Avalair Health, a healthcare and life sciences consulting company. I am also a consultant through NYU's compact program to Janssen Pharmaceuticals, which is a part of Johnson & Johnson. But I want to assure you that neither Avalier nor Janssen have seen this, nor have they had any input on what I say. So all thoughts here are my own, except for the fact that I've obviously been influenced by my working group that I just mentioned. So with disclosures out of the way, what is compassionate use? And Nancy was kind enough a minute ago to say access to investigational drugs. So that basically uh, sums that up. But I'll go through my slides anyway, because they're here and I think they're useful. Um, so basically to understand what compassionate use is, you have to understand how we get a new medical product. And it can be any kind of product. It could be a drug, it could be a device, it could be a vaccine. But uh, each of those has slightly different permutations, and so for the sake of simplicity, I'm only going to talk about drugs today. And so if you want to bring a new drug to market, it goes through this pathway that is undoubtedly familiar to many of you in this room. Uh, can the people in the back see or do? Yeah, okay. Um, so basically, you start with your bench research, your laboratory research. You move through preclinical -pre testing, which involves the animal trials, and then you move into your testing on humans. And testing on humans involves three stages. The first stage, known as phase one, is safety testing, uh, typically done on healthy volunteers, except for with some uh, carve outs like oncology. You wouldn't test a new oncology drug on a healthy volunteer. Phase two is where you start to look for efficacy in your target population to see if the drug is doing what you think it's going to do in the people you want to be uh, impacting. Phase three is where you would probably be doing a comparison of either the new drug versus a placebo or perhaps the new drug versus the standard treatment drug. And finally, if uh, you have positive results out of all three of those uh, phases of clinical research, you would, in uh, conjunction with the FDA, move towards uh, putting together a very large packet that you submit to the FDA. The FDA has an independent panel that they bring together to review your application and decide whether to let you sell this new drug or not. 
Um, once you get approval, you prepare for launch, during which you're making sure you have enough of the drug, you have doctors trained to know how to use it, uh, you have your marketing campaign lined up, you have insurers willing to pay for the drug, et cetera. And then at the end of all that, there's a drug. And that's when most patients, you and I uh, included, would be able to go to the pharmacy and be able to get access to that drug. So compassionate use is when a patient with no other therapeutic options requests to use a drug that is not yet at that endpoint, a drug that's not yet approved for sale or use. And typically, the drug would be in one of these uh, three, three stages, either the phase two efficacy testing, the phase three uh, comparative testing, or the testing is done and the company is just preparing for the FDA uh, approval or the launch. Now that doesn't mean that patients only request during these times. We, we have known of patients who request for a phase one drug that has only been safety tested. We've even known patients who have requested drugs that have only been tested on animals. But for the most part, uh, <coughs> drug companies will not consider granting any compassionate use request outside of these three start areas. And the other thing that we should talk about when we're talking about definitions is uh, there is a plethora of terms for activity in this area. Um, in the United States, we use terms like expanded access, which is the FDA terminology. <laughs> Typically, when the media gets involved, people talk about compassionate use, which is the language I'm using here today, although I would not use that if I was talking to the FDA. Um, and in different countries, they have their own terms for it. So I just flagged some of the more common terms there, especially for any of you who are clinicians, you may have uh, had familiarity with some of these terms before. So that's our uh, staking out of the terms, and now let me just stake out my argument. I say, discussions of compassionate use, and this is talking about in, in a media setting or just when we're talking amongst ourselves, are normally focused on the individual who's pleading for access to this drug. And we talk about someone's right to try to preserve his or her life, we talk about someone deserving a chance, and what I want to argue is that we need to start talking not only about the individual, but about um, the public and its rights and its interests with regard to compassionate use. And I'll flesh all that out as I go along, and particularly as I go through the case study I want to talk about. But I'll just say right now, some of you may already agree with this, at which point I'll be preaching to the choir, and I thank you for your patience. Um, but I'll just tell you that you and I are in the minority. Um, I can assure you that uh, with speaking with numerous reporters about this topic, with numerous patient advocacy organizations about this topic, you and I are in the minority. Um, if you disagree with my take, you and I can debate during the question and answer period. But first, uh, let me go through this case study with you. And this is a fairly famous case study, and I just found out from talking with Nancy this morning that y'all actually have um, a relationship with one of the main characters, so I apologize if I'm covering ground that some of you already know very well, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, so this is the case study of Josh Hardy. Can I see a show of hands if anyone is familiar with the Josh Hardy case? So, a little bit less than half the group, okay. Josh Hardy is a Virginia boy. At nine months old, he was diagnosed with a very rare, very aggressive kidney cancer. And he underwent radiation, he underwent chemo and some other treatments in order to survive his cancer. He had four cancer-free years, but he uh, was left with kidney and heart complications as a result of his ordeal. And in November of 2013, he was diagnosed with a bone marrow disorder stemming from his earlier treatments. So in January of 2014, he underwent a bone marrow transplant, um, which unfortunately had complications, and he developed uh, an adenovirus infection. He was moved to the ICU with heart and breathing issues. And adenovirus is a fairly common virus that uh, most people with functioning immune systems can overcome without much problem. But for someone who has a compromised immune system, such as this young boy, uh, it can be a life-threatening disorder, a uh, life-threatening infection, and he had a very poor prognosis. He was being treated at St. Jude's Medical Center, and the doctors were familiar with a investigational, uh, broad-spectrum antiviral drug called brinsodafavir, and they, uh, it had been tested at St. Jude's for other disease, uh, other viruses, and the doctors told Josh's family 
that Josh's infection would be cured if they could get a hold of this drug. So the, the family asked, can we get the drug? The St. Jude's Medical Center contacted the drug manufacturer and explained the situation and asked if they could get it for Josh, and the company <coughs> denied the request. Uh, Josh's condition continued to deteriorate. The end was looking very close at hand, and in early March, once Josh developed renal failure, St. Jude again requested the drug, and the company again denied it. So here's some background on the drug. Brenzidofibir had been used against adenovirus uh, infections in other compassionate use cases, and they had successful outcomes reported. But you should know the company was not actually testing Brenzidofibir as an adenovirus treatment. It was testing it as a treatment against a uh, cytomegalovirus in adult uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipients. That's what it was trying to convince the FDA that the drug was um, effective for, not adenovirus. Even though, again, we had you know this sort of case cases of successful use of adenovirus. And here's some other background. Chimerics, the company that was uh, shepherding this drug along, was a 55-person company, which if you think about like the multinational pharmaceutical companies like Johnson & Johnson is tiny. And Brenzidofavir was its only drug in the pipeline. So the company was basically going to live or die on the success of Brenzidofavir. Uh, in 2009, uh, Chimerics began a compassionate use program, and it gave the drug to more than uh, 430 patients. In 2011, Chimerics ended the Compassionate Use Program. And just anecdotally here, I'll tell you, the funding at this point in time for Brenstofavir was coming from the Department of Defense, which thought that this sounded like a good drug to have on hand in case we needed to treat smallpox infections. Uh, when the Department of Defense withdrew its funding is when the Compassionate Use Program ended. So by the time the request was made on Josh's behalf, the company had denied over 300 requests for the drug. And by knowing that background, you know more than anyone in the general public uh, at the point in time that Josh's request was being made. And you certainly know more than this man knew. This is Richard Plotkin. Richard Plotkin is a former trial attorney. Uh, some of you will be familiar with him from the mesothelioma, I can never say that word. Uh, cases against asbestos, uh, in which he bulldoggedly claimed that his uh, corporate clients were not responsible for people getting this fairly rare cancer and all the ill effects that accompanied it. Uh, after his grandchild contracted a pediatric cancer and was a survivor, he turned himself into a full-time pediatric cancer advocate. And he was contacted on the basis of the fact that his pediatric cancer advocate had asked if there was anything he could do for Josh Hardy. So he decided that he was going to be a trial attorney for Josh Hardy, and as you do when you're a trial attorney, he was going to win at all cost. He was going to get Josh the drug, or he was going to destroy chimerics. So his strategy involved the parents taking their story public. Amy Hardy, Josh's mother, wrote a post on her Facebook page explaining um, Josh's situation, explaining the request had been denied, and basically asking, if, you know, is there anyone out there who has contacts or has some idea on how we can get Chimerics to change its decision? And Plotkin's uh, Cancer Foundation hired a media specialist to just drive this message out there in any outlet that it could find. So this is just an excerpt from Amy's um, posting, and I apologize that it's so wordy, so I'll read it to you. Our son, Josh Hardy, who recently had a bone marrow transplant, has developed the adenovirus. This is a deadly virus for people who have weak immune systems. There is a drug called Brenzidofavir that has been proved to treat the adenovirus effectively. Our doctor at St. Jude told us that they ran the study for the drug company and he knows it will work. However, the drug company has refused to release the drug for compassionate care because they are trying to take it to market. Basically, they are not going to save a child's life for money. So this is the message that was being pumped out there through every avenue that they could find. And within hours, people started calling into Chimerics, contacting uh, the boards, uh, the board members of the company, uh, contacting their senators, their you know elected representatives, basically anything people could think of to try to bring power, uh, to you know bring pressure against the company. The same day, Josh's uncle 
uh, launched both a Facebook page and a Twitter site called hashtag Save Josh. And from Save Josh, uh, which went viral and had you know pro athletes and, and people from around the world uh, retweeting this message. And, and you can see a picture of Josh and his family here. And you can see that one of his brothers is wearing a Josh's Army shirt. So I mean, any number of publicity get gathering things that they could come up with to try to promote their case. Um, someone from my hometown of Mechanicsville, Virginia, thank you, started a change.org petition to try to get, convince the company to give access. And Richard Plotkin, through contacts with uh, Fox News, got it on Fox and Friends. Clean to life drug company refuses to help seven-year-old boy. So this is all happening in a space of days because this is social media and it doesn't take long for things to, to go around the world and come back again. And while the intensity on this, you know, this, this side of the story is ramping up, in contrast, what you're seeing on the media is this. Now, this is Ken Mock. This is the CEO of Chimerics. And for those of you who don't know him, I can assure you that he is a very thoughtful, very nice man. But this is the image that was being run 24-7 on Fox and Friends and, and being tweeted out and what have you. And, you know, he just kind of looks happy with himself and, and self-assured with his lot in life and very much, you know, like a, a successful pharmaceutical CEO. And um, so it's kind of the, the visual battle between the images of this dying boy and his family versus this. So losing the, uh, the battle of sympathetic media, uh, Mark put out a statement trying to explain rationally to the world the stance. Part of it says, five years ago, early in Brent's doctor's <laughs> clinical development pathway, Chimerics began receiving requests from physicians for the emergency use of Brent's And we were able to supply Brent's doctor for relatively small numbers of these requests. As our small company progressed to larger and more complex efficacy and safety trials designed to gain FDA approval of Brent's doctor we made the difficult decision two years ago to cease our compassionate use program and focus on earning FDA approval. This is the only path to making Brinsadofavir widely available to those who need it in the fastest manner allowed. So, again, you have a battle of the competing narratives. Hardy's mother is saying the drug company has refused to release the drug because they're trying to take it to market. Basically, they're not going to save a child's life for money. Mock, on the other hand, is arguing that Chimerics couldn't offer compassionate use because it was a small company, and due to the limitations of personnel and the expertise required to um, monitor adverse reactions and stuff like this, he could not have his company simultaneously do a compassionate use program for, remember, in excess of 300-some people, because that's how many people had requested, in addition to, to um, Josh, while at the same time bringing this drug to market. And, in uh, this quote right here, he, he's making the case that he's prioritizing a larger group of patients. He just makes a straight utility argument. He's a, you know, the, this is the only path to making Brent's Dothavir widely available to those who need it in the fastest manner allowed. So he's saying, we have a small group of people who want it on compassionate use grounds. We have a larger group of people who need it through the regular process. So we're going to serve that larger group of people by plowing full steam ahead towards that. And he also made another point, just saying that it's unfair to give it to Josh. 300 some people have requested it, and we've said no to all of them. And then along comes this one boy, and yes, he's cute, but what makes him so special that we should uh, give him something that nobody else has gotten? So you can probably guess which one of these competing narratives um, resonated more with the American viewing public but I'll show a few slides to make it clear. I know the people that I can't see this. So I'll, this is just a, a tweet from Chimerics, just announcing that you know, Ken Mock's going to be presenting at a conference today. And these are three. And I did not cherry pick these. these are, this is just a straight screenshot. Uh, Mike says, Chimerics, please help Josh and God bless you. Save Josh. Mac says, people have offered to pay for the treatment. Make this a requirement for compassionate use cases. All caps, we are watching you, save Josh. Rick says, Chimerics, are you actually humans? Do you have a heart? I am shocked at how horrific your CEO is. Is he for real? 
JF says chimeric. So the set price of one child's life is 50,000 US dollars. Is this what we are all reduced to now? This is why I didn't get an MBA. <laughs> so basically, you know, Ken Bach tried to make this appeal to rationality and, and show that, you know, it's unfortunate that we can't take care of everyone at once, but we have to prioritize, and this is the response he's getting. Um, so the prevailing narrative, obviously, was that pharma didn't care about Josh, they just wanted to make money. The, I, the, the discussion of, you know, would it be fair to give Josh the drug when 300 some people didn't get it completely drops out. The idea of, you know, there's this larger population waiting for a drug and they'll have to wait longer if we stop to take care of all these compassionate use requests completely drops out. And, you know, it boils down to, here's our friend Richard Plotkin, the advocate, again, on Fox and Friends. And he's saying, like, we raise the money. Like, we, we're going to give them money. We're going to give them $50,000 just to treat this one boy. And they still say no. So the narrative that's happening here is that it's all about the money. And as you could probably uh, pick up from those tweets that I read you, you know, the, the level of vitriol is rising. Vitriol, sorry, is rising. And people are getting, you know, more and more wrought up about this. And so to make a long story short, uh, Ken Mock and his family actually ended up getting death threats, and the FBI deemed them serious enough that he was uh, advised to move temporarily to an undisclosed location. And, as you can imagine, that was fairly traumatic. Uh, it made a big impression on him, which is why he's now very actively involved in compassionate use. And for interest of full disclosure, he is a member of our working group, which is why I have this uh, you know, micro level of detail, because uh, he thinks about this almost daily. But um, so, so things seem to be coming to a head. We have death threats. We have a company that's refusing to give the drug. You know, it kind of seems like there's nowhere left to go. And then voila, seemingly out of the blue, there's a resolution. Chimerics puts out this uh, press release. Chimerics to provide Brenzidafavir to Josh Hardy as first patient in new open label study in patients with adenovirus infections. So, it's not compassionate use, it's a new trial, which traditionally is what we do when we want to test a new drug on people, is we start a trial. But the advocates won in the sense that they were focused on getting the drug into Josh Hardy, they didn't really care how it happened, they just wanted it to happen and he got the drug. Um, and just to, uh, to, to bring our dramatic arc to uh, a decrescendo, I'll, I'll, you know, alleviate the suspense and tell you uh, the adenovirus was treated. He is still alive. He's at home. He's still a very sick boy who has many health implications, but at least he survived that one episode. And whereas nobody can state definitively from an N of one, you know, he was cured by the Brinstoffavir, it looks like it worked in adenovirus, at least in that case. Um, and so what happened to Ken Mock, as many of you know, Ken Mock was summarily shown to the door and replaced. <coughs> so this case is instructive, at least I think it's instructive, because it shows the dilemma at stake. It shows that in this case, I would argue, everyone had great intentions. The family wanted to save their child. The clinicians wanted to save this young boy. The uh, Ken Mock wanted to bring this very promising new drug to market to benefit a large number of people who needed a new broad-spectrum antiviral. And all good intentions on all parties, well, I guess the people who wanted to kill Ken Mock <laughs> didn't have good intentions, but I guess they thought it was like a means to the ends of helping Josh somehow. Um, so anyway, everyone arguably had good intentions, but it still shows that there's this inescapable tension between trying to rescue distinct individuals who find themselves in this situation of not having available treatments and drug development for populations. So let me run through a couple takeaways from the case, uh, and I'm not going to dwell on any of these because I think they're pretty obvious. But you know, this case shows the amplifier effect of social media. Like I said, this took place over a matter of days. This was not, um, you know, a long drawn out thing. The anonymity of social media, I think, was really responsible for the ratcheting up of, um, you know, just the anger being expressed, and finally the the death threats. I, I'm not going to go back and parse it out, but I'm sure y'all saw in some of the statements that I quoted just the lack of 
medical understanding or, or scientific understanding on the parts of uh, parents, um, patient advocates, the media, you know, just this idea like he will definitely be cured if he gets this drug. The inability of the company to control the message, um, you know, their fact-based press release wasn't doing it. The, the trumping of this rescue narrative over the idea of, you know, the good of a population. And finally, this fairness issue, the, the fact that um, Josh's request was being supported by all these people because he was an appealing young boy who had, you know, attractive photos and a, and a puppy and he, he seemed young and innocent and likable. His family had access to the internet, they had access to pediatric uh, cancer advocates who could work on their behalf, they had access to top doctors. And just uh, sort of parenthetically, at NYU we just had what I call the anti-Josh Hardy case. We had a patient who came to us and asked for help getting an investigational drug product. And he was not young, he was not appealing, he was not nice, uh, he was frankly uh, threatening and litigious, like, you know, the idea that he wasn't going to get this drug. And you could completely see why the drug company didn't want anything to do with him. But I would argue, like, whether he's nice or not, or whether he seems like an appealing person or not, should not be grounds for deciding whether he gets access to a drug any more than Josh Hardy seeming young and vulnerable and innocent. So, that's just me. So anyway, this is enough to make this a fascinating case. And I could probably stop right here, and Nancy's probably saying, yes, just stop right here, but <laughs> I'm not. I'm going forward, because this is a case that just keeps giving. Um, and the epilogue of this case has a, a number of important points that I want to make, so I'm just going to trace the story forward a bit more. So here is a, uh, a press release that comes out in February of this year. And it's talking about the study, this uh, advised study of rinse valfavir for adenovirus infection. That was the study set up to treat Josh. That study held little risk for the company. They, the reason that they could take it on is because they were not pursuing an indication in adenovirus. They were pursuing a indication in CMV. So if the drug didn't work in adenovirus, if something horrible happened to Josh, they could say, okay, great, we tried, you know, too bad, let's close the trial, no big deal. In this case, they got positive results. Not only Josh, but other people showed that uh, brinzidopavir seemed to be working well in adenovirus. So that was good news. And um, the good news, in, in this case, the good clinical news was also good news for the company. It set, it set the company's stock price up. At this point, no longer dependent on Department of Defense funding, the company has gone public. And its stock price, you know, goes up because people are like, great, this is a drug that's effective not only in, in one population, but in another disease, and let's buy. And remember, brinzidopavir was a chimerics only drug. So basically what happened, you know, the fate of brinzidopavir determines the fate of chimerics. And then comes Ebola. Uh, remember Thomas Eric Duncan, who flew from Liberia to Texas and then ended up getting deadly ill? He got brinzidopavir. He died. Stock tumbled. Now, if the stock losses were severe enough, given that this was the company's only drug, it could have seriously damaged or even bankrupted the company. Now, in this case, Brinzidopavir was almost over the finish line with regard to its first study, the one in CMV. It's in phase three, it's concluding, it has enough data to go before the FDA, so it was relatively insulated. But if Brinzidopavir had been, back to that, that diagram I showed you of drug development, if it had been in phase one or phase two, when it goes back to its investors and say, we need more money, they're going to say, this drug sucks. It killed that Ebola patient. I'm not giving you any more money. Um, so, it, I mean, it really, honestly, could have killed the company if, if the circumstances had been slightly different. Um, and even if it didn't kill the company, it could have led to a temporary cash flow or a you know, problem or something like that, which would have resulted in slowing the trial, slowing you know, all the steps that it has to go through to end up having a new effective drug on the market. And I just want to make an analogy here, although it's not perfect, to the uh, Jesse Gilsinger case. 
Now, Jesse Gelsinger was not a case of compassionate use. He was enrolled in a clinical trial, but he died from a gene therapy trial. His death was highly publicized, and I've seen estimates that the field of gene therapy as a whole was sent back, you know, some people estimate as much as a decade as a result of it. So just thinking about that one case, and then thinking about these sort of, uh, you know, uh, market forces and their impact on drug development. I mean, these aren't things that we think about day in, day out, but you can see how uh, the, the bad outcome of this particular compassionate use case on Thomas Eric Duncan really could have had real life ramifications for bringing a drug to market and thus to all the patients who downstream would be using that drug. And just to give another example um, about how a bad outcome can hurt a company and by extension patients, this is, this is a very recent one. This is uh, November 2014. Uh, this is an com uh, oncology company that was uh, testing some uh, chemical for brain cancer and one of their compassionate use patients died, at which point the FDA stepped in and put a, clinic, a clinical hold on their studies. Now, the clinical hold did not seem to last very long, and I don't have any evidence that it hurt uh, accrual to the trial or anything like that, so I'm not saying, you know, patients died because of this, but it's just more evidence that bad outcomes in compassionate use can slow down or even kill um, a trial or, you know, the other steps necessary to bring a drug to market. So, ramifications. One noteworthy ramification that I think people are always surprised in a good way to hear about is that uh, Richard Plotkin, the patient advocate for Josh Hardy, who decided that he was going to get Josh the drug or else destroy chimerics in the process, had a crisis of conscience after he started learning more about compassionate use. He would be the first one to tell you that he had never even heard the term compassionate use before this came up. And to him, it was just like, there's a dying child can you do something to help? Sure, I'll you know throw the kitchen sink at it and see what I could do. But it was like a bull in a china shop. He really had no idea what he was doing. And the more that he has learned, the more he says that what he did was he doesn't regret saving saving Josh, uh, but he says that you know he inadvertently let a genie out of the bottle that he really wished he hadn't. He's now Mock's biggest defender. And actually, uh, we were together at Congress. Um, for a pediatric cancer caucus, and people up on stage were bad mouthing Ken Mock, and Richard Plotkin, you know, indignantly rose out of his seat and was like, you know, this man has saved lives. How many of you have saved lives? So, you know, uh, he he would say now that he's a hero, um, and is very passionate about that. But but more than that, this is this is a piece that Plotkin wrote. I was asked to get involved in helping three other children with cancer obtain experimental drugs. I then realized how arbitrary the system is relative to the granting of compassionate use waivers by the FDA, and what an incredible burden is placed on those of us in the advocacy arena trying to help save the lives of children with cancer. Given what our group was able to, given what our group was able to assist in accomplishing for the Hardys, I realized we had within our power the ability and burden to help decide which children would be given a chance to live and which would continue on the path to premature death. Of the three children, I elected not to get involved for two. In my limited world, I was making a decision as to who should live and who should die, a very uncomfortable position to be in. So basically he's saying, now I'm the Ken Mock. You know, there's more demand than I can possibly fulfill, and I have to decide who I'm going to use my resources to help. So he says, I realize that something must be done to establish a better system to determine who shall live and who shall die relative to the issuance of compassionate use waivers. So at the time that he wrote this, um, uh, Richard Clock, the, the cancer advocate, has become acutely aware of the fact that, you know, Ken Mock wasn't just being a hard-hearted ass. <laughs> There's like a real issue here. And he's also talking about you know, the, the justice and the equity issues of how you possibly decide. If you can't help everyone, you know, on what grounds do you make this decision? But at this time, he's still thinking access to an investigational product equals cure. He, he's very deluded 
by his one case in which it happened to be true that access to an investigational product saved a person, you know, this idea of therapeutic misconception. You know, so he is still pushing full speed ahead towards people need access to drugs. It's just he's like, well, I can't help everyone, and this is an untenable situation. Now, because this is a rapidly evolving story, he now has, con has come to understand that he was misguided by this therapeutic misconception and that in some cases access to an investigational drug isn't going to do anything. In some cases it could even hurt. And so his, his new thing at the moment is not only that we need a, a new and better system to decide who gets compassionate use, but he is also laser focused on the idea that you need to educate people, particularly advocates and particularly you know, those involved in, in these medical worlds on understanding just the whole process. Like what is the clinical trial? What is an investigational drug? What are the phases? What, you know, what do we know about the drugs? Can they hurt people? So that's his uh, current quest, and uh, just given his persona that we've described here, and given the fact that he has the nickname of Barracuda, um, <laughs> I'm not personally betting against him, and I think there's going to be a lot of education <clears throat> happening in the pediatric cancer community. But aside from that story, there's some other ramifications. And again, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but as you can probably imagine, companies are scared of compassionate use in social media campaigns. Uh, since being fired from Chimerics, Ken Mock's full-time job is to speak to companies and conventions full of business people who, you know, are, are desperate to hear his story and to learn the lessons from it so they don't become the next Ken Mock. Uh, patient advocates feel empowered to seek out access to investigational treatments and by access anything that will get them a cure in hand faster. So whether that means like changing trial design, whether that means you know, throwing out the FDA, like whatever it takes, if it gets them cures in hands faster, patient advocates are, are really excited about this idea. And going along with that, there is now this raft of state and national legislative efforts to uh, expedite patients' access to investigational treatments. More ramifications, because remember, we have Ebola. And the question is, if you can test uh, sorry, if unapproved treatments that haven't even been tested for safety on people can be used ethically with the blessing of the WHO and, you know, other bodies on people who are dying of Ebola, why in this country can't you use these same, you know, likely, if at all, tested products on people dying of other things? If a death is a death, why do we have one set of rules for people dying of everything except for Ebola? And then at the same time, um, this comes directly from a, a class that I taught that involved um, frontline polio vaccinators with UNICEF. They say the whole reason we're able to do what we do is because for decades we've been making it clear we don't test unapproved products on people. If we come and give you something, it's a tested and approved intervention that's here to help you. And they're saying, we're going to get killed. The next time we go into some, you know, unfriendly district in Pakistan or something, and they know that people are giving out untested treatments for Ebola, they're going to think we're giving out untested treatments, and we're going to get killed. So, I mean, this is a, a, a huge issue, which I'm not going to talk about further because I'm running out of time. But I'll just say this: this uh, questions about compassionate use in Ebola, unfortunately, is the only area in which I am seeing any. Um, acknowledgement of the fact that compassionate use affects populations. It doesn't affect just the individual person in need or even just their family. Compassionate use, you know, affects whole groups of people who are situated uh, together because they need access to a certain drug. And so that leads me back to my argument that I showed you from the outset. Just saying discussions of compassionate use are typically focused on people all this concern about Josh Hardy and trying to keep him alive and r really no discussion. You know, a, a valiant attempt on Ken Mock's part, but otherwise no real discussion of the fact that there was also a, a population whose interest was at stake in this case. And, you know, but I just say we need to start talking not only about these individuals, but about the public and its rights and interests. And so then the question is, what are these rights and interests? And I would say, you know, the orderly development of new drugs 
so that not only current patients but future populations of patients can benefit from them. That's a benefit, that's a public benefit for all of us. And also having an effective, um, you know, functional FDA, I would argue is a public benefit for all of us. And we can talk about this during the Q&A if you're interested, but I really see in some of the state and legislative efforts that have grown out of this case and other recent capacity use cases, a real uh, sort of libertarian movement to push the FDA out of uh, at least compassionate use and possibly out of other areas of medical decision making. Um, so I'm, I'm going to finish up just by, uh, let me conclude by pulling up an image that at least some of the people in the room are familiar with and those people I ask you please not to groan, but it's the famous <laughs> trolley problem. <laughs> And I told Mariah uh, Merritt that I was so happy she wasn't actually going to be here because I would be too embarrassed to talk about the trolley problem in front of a philosopher. Because <laughs> I'm not a philosopher and I don't play on TV. But here is the trolley problem. So for most of you who are familiar with this, you know, the idea is you have this trolley. It's headed down a track. It's going to run over, presumably kill or seriously injure five people. And our random bystander just happens to have at his hands the means by which to divert the trolley away from these, you know, uh, seeming to be soon victims. But in doing so, he's going to have to divert it onto this other track, which unfortunately is not victimless. There's going to be at least, you know, one person injured by this. And of course, for philosophers, the question is, you know, should you do that? Should you not? I'm not going to go there, but what I'm going to say is let's think about the trolley question a little bit differently and think that this is our life-saving trolley because inside of it, it has our new drug. Right now, it's headed down the path towards being delivered to all these people. This population of people is waiting for it. And the question is, do we divert it over to take care of this one person who admittedly is in need, admittedly is probably in dire need, but it's a diversion. And so then I go back and question myself a little bit. And I said, well, if it's just a little diversion, you know, maybe that's okay. We just had a small hiccup and then they can continue on to the larger population with, you know, two weeks. <coughs> so that's not a big deal. And then I say, well, what happens if the diversion's longer? What happens if it's a two-year diversion? You know, they still, they still get to the larger population, but it took two years longer than it would have. Is, is that acceptable? Is that not acceptable? And then I say, well, sometimes there is no diversion. Sometimes, especially if you have like a large multinational company that has lots of resources, you can do the two simultaneously. And so we'd all like that to happen. We'd like to be able to help everybody at the same time. But especially in the case of the chimerics, which is tiny and has <coughs> limited resources, I just think the fact of the case is we can't help everybody at the same time. And so my argument is we need to have this discussion. And if at the end of our discussion we say rescue is so important to us that no matter you know, what the diversion entails, we need to divert, that's fine. I'm okay with that. I'm not opposed to that. All I'm saying is we need to have the discussion. And my concern is right now I don't see any signs of that discussion as arising spontaneously. So that's my talk. And if you want more, those are two recent blog pieces I wrote on this while I was thinking through it. And that's my Twitter hashtag where I spend, I spend a lot of time talking about compassionate use, particularly with regard to people who are in favor of right to try laws, which I do not favor. <laughs> and I'd be happy to talk about that during the question and answer. as they ask their question that might be helpful for our guest. Thank you for being an attentive audience. I didn't see a single person fall asleep, which I appreciate. <laughs> Hi, so my name is Amanda Jamal. I'm a PhD student here and also a genetic counselor by training. Okay. Um, and so my question is, you mentioned that one of the considerations Chimerics took into account was that um, they couldn't administer a compassionate use program at the same time as they could bring a drug to market, right? And so my question is whether you think it's morally problematic in any way that the, that decision sort of rests on whether there's a market demand for the drug and whether the FDA approval process has been working and the evidence thresholds have been met you know, to bring it to that point. Um, is, is that somehow at the level of the population a worry? So I heard what you said, but I'm not 
not sure I'm following because if it doesn't look like so the drug is being it, effective they enough. they felt like there was no point in doing a trial, you know, without it changed things. If, if there was no incentive to do a trial, if there, was, if there wasn't a wherewithal somehow, like they're making a rare disease drugs, which maybe are less profitable and lucrative to bring to market. And that's also kind of, I think, a large population that tends to want to rely on compassionate use. So, actually, rare disease is immensely profitable well, at the yeah, moment yeah. because, know, because uh, yeah, because the, the Congress got involved. Um, and you're right, compassionate use is a very active field. And I mean, I think I think a better analogy, a better way of thinking. I'm just thinking this through as I, as I'm talking. Is something like Ebola. You know, there was not a disease, there was not a demand for an Ebola drug, um, and so it didn't happen. And if there had been an outbreak in West Africa and they started demanding, you know, compassionate use access to a drug, there just wouldn't have been anything there to give them. I mean, there just would have been like the earliest of early phase treatments because that's all that was on the table. So it's hard for me to understand exactly. Yeah, I guess, I guess the point I'm making is just the public demand for a drug, I guess, determines whether it, the value and maybe the viability of a clinical trial or the, the, the certain number of, of people and resources that are going to get put into the development of a drug for the public. I mean, I think we completely agree on that. I mean, <coughs> pharmaceutical companies, for the most part, are in it to make money. There are some exceptions to that. But for the most part, you know, they're going to go for the largest population they can find, and then they preferably want a population that's going to be able to afford the drug. Right. Um, and, you know, obviously that r r results in inequity, you know, disparities in terms of what diseases get addressed. Right. Thanks. And just to follow up, it, it, it seems like another implication is that if only the big drug companies can afford to go down your two paths at the same time, then you're even less likely to have a company like Comerix have any interest in investing in a drug that may serve a very small population, right? That yeah. it, if, if they didn't think they could pursue that clinical trial, they, they probably wouldn't exist, right? Because there would be no profit in 300 compassionate uses each year. So I really think it's also the, the context within which these things happen and those market forces that are working at those different levels. I mean, one of the things that has been so fascinating for me learning about this topic is to find out the sort of stresses that are placed on patient advocates. And, and I'm getting back to your point, but, but if you're around the that way. When there's a compassionate use case, particularly when it's in a, in a defined community, um, there's suddenly all this attention on this one family and its need, either for a drug or, you know, possibly for a new device or even for money. You know, like, you know, we need the money to fly so-and-so to this location. The, the patient advocacy group that is attached to that particular person is really torn because they say, you know, is it our role to support this person who's part of our community? Or is it our role to support our larger community? And by funneling all this attention onto this one person, we are de facto taking resources away from the rest of our community. There's going to be giving fatigue, you know, on the issue of MS or, or whatever next year because all people suddenly sent money. And they didn't send money to the MS society, they sent it to this family. So they're very conflicted about, you know, we want to help this one person, but we want to do what's best for our community, and maybe what's doing best for our community is not helping this one person, but then how do you explain that to your community members who get mad at you because you're not helping this person? So I'm actually in the middle of putting together a conference to deal exactly with this issue because I keep running into patient advocates who are like, what are we supposed to do? But, but this goes into the drug development issue because more and more, we see patient communities getting into drug development. They're either funding drug development or funding researchers, or even in some cases, creating their own drug companies. And then it, you know, the, it comes up even more because we want to do compassionate use. The whole reason we're here is to save kids with MPS or whatever, but so, you know, we, we only have X amount of money, we only have X amount of time, and. You know, we have this one viable candidate that we think will be good, 
but we need to push on to the FDA so we can make it available to all the kids at the same time that 10 kids a year are asking for compassionate use. So, I mean, it's a truly heartbreaking thing. I'm, I'm wondering uh, how much hope you really have for this conversation that you're, you're hoping will actually occur. When a kid falls down a well, which happens, um, communities devote enormous resources to, to rescuing that kid, knowing intellectually that they could take those same resources and buy smoke alarms for everyone in, in the um, community and save more lives right. that way. But we're never going to do that. And no, and no conversation is ever going to prevent us from devoting those resources to the kid in the well. So, I'm, so again, I'm wondering how much it's great to say, let's talk about it, but I'm wondering how, how hopeful we should be that that conversation is going to be fruitful. So that, that is a great question, and I have a couple of responses to it. One is that uh, I've only been actively involved in this project for a little bit under a year, and I'm not jaded yet, so <laughs> let, me have my, let me have my groundless optimism Absolutely. that dialogue can actually sure. make a difference. Um, number two is I think that maybe I'm hopelessly deluded. I think we're in like this moment, like a perfect storm type moment where patient advocates are suddenly realizing that they need to be a lot more educated about all of this, like drug development, um, you know, why policy decisions about allocation, especially what scarce resources are made the way that they are. And to the extent that there's an interest and enthusiasm right now, I just want to go with that. And that's why I'm working as much as I am with patient advocates and saying, you know, yes, like, let's educate people. And, and maybe, you know, if we have the discussion and you want to do something that is very laudable but not rational, then that's fine. That's fine. But let's, like, at least have an educated discussion first. So, so that's my comments about that. My, my real comment? <laughs> they're never going to stop doing rescue. So I would like to say, fine, we've had a discussion. You still want to do rescue. So let's do it right. Let's not do a system where it's whoever's cute or whoever has access to social media or whoever you know, can afford to hire a publicist gets access. Let's come up with something like a public fund and fund compassionate use. And that way, you know, whether you're like the cranky, you know, mean guy who is very profane and not happy that people are giving him his drug, or a cute seven-year-old, you know, there you have, well, first off, so I, I, I advocate setting up some sort of like independent body to help make these decisions, and, and I'm actually involved in a, in a pilot along those lines. But then I also say, you know, if it's really important to us that we rescue people, then we need to set aside resources to make that happen. So. And so, like, if Chimerics can't afford to do both, then we'll give them some money. So they, so. I'm Caleb Alexander. I'm a former epidemiologist, so I think about this stuff in a different context a bit. But um, I'm interested in this independent body, actually. So I guess now I have two questions. So one is, what independent body are you thinking about? And how would you foresee pharmaceutical firms buying in? And sort of what sort of precedent is that? Setting that aside, do you really, I mean, I, I don't know much about Chimera's, uh, you know, the manufacturer's bottom line, but um, I guess I'm just wondering if manufacturers are really as constrained, resource constrained as um, kind of, you know, in many settings uh, it may appear. So I, I don't know much about the details, the regulatory policies regarding compassionate use, but um, are they not allowed to charge revenue, you know, to, 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 to charge for the products? And even if they aren't, um, it, you know, these firms generally do have really deep pockets. So I realize that this may be kind of an exceptional case for that reason, but I guess I'm just questioning if they're, they're really so resource constrained. So, unfortunately, I can't tell you much about this new uh, independent arbitrating body because uh, I'm under confidentiality restrictions at this point, but I would say watch the news because <laughs> there'll be a press release coming out very soon. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, with regard to your other question, the large pharmaceutical companies are grossly deep pocketed. And that's why I say if anybody can afford to do the two tracks at once, 
it's them. And for them to say that they can't, I think we would have to have like a real dollars and cents discussion of, you know, well, what exactly is the disease? You know, how common is it? You know, if it's a rare disease, then I think that you couldn't argue on grounds of like, we just don't have the money to do this. If it was a very common disease, then you know, perhaps even the most deep pocketed company in the world couldn't afford to run a compassionate use program. So, so I think there, there are you know, nuances there that would depend on the particular disease, particular drug, et cetera. The small companies, they're on a shoestring. I mean, I can't tell you how many companies I've consulted with at this point where it's you know, anywhere from 10 to 100 people um, living from venture capitalist to venture capitalist, um, routinely outsourcing anything they can to contract research organizations just because it's cheaper to do that than to do things in-house. So and can they charge for products that are administered with yes. compassionate use? The problem, so what if this the is problem just the cost of doing business, the cost of drug development? I mean, it includes a billion dollars to bring a drug to market. What if we make it 1.2 billion? And, uh, include the cost of compassionate use. So the problem with that, I would argue, is um, no insurance company will pay for an experimental drug. Basically, insurance companies in the United States follow what uh, Medicaid and Medicare do, and I've talked to Medicaid and Medicare, and they assure me under fleetingly small circumstances what they consider paying for an experimental drug. So then you're introducing the inequity into the situation because only people who could afford to pay for the drug would have access. And then the question is, how much do you charge for a drug when you have desperate people trying to get it? And you can imagine a company that would have both an incentive and give in to the incentive to really drastically mark up the price of that compassionate use drug because they have a desperate population who can go on to crowdsourcing websites or whatnot and try to raise the money to get it. So I think because of situations like that, people have decided most companies, when they give compassionate use, they do it for free or they do it for just like, you know, the actual cost of, of getting the drug to you, you know, by courier or something like that. So there are certainly people who think that market forces can, can remedy this, and I'm happy to talk with you at length longer about that, but I see other hands, so if you don't mind, I will field them for a second. So I just want to, I'm, I'm feeling awkward because I see that it's five, but I can't restrain myself <laughs> from making one more comment. It's obviously such an interesting conversation. It seems that we have with your, I, I love using the trolley analogy in this way. We've been talking so far about diverting only in the sense of resources, only in the sense of are they sufficiently staffed, are they sufficiently financed to be able to simultaneously run a trial and give drug to people. But I've also be, been talking about time. And in time, fine. But it seems to me that um, an extraordinary diversionary threat is that once compassionate use becomes available, people don't join the trial. Yes. And, and that to me is a that. much bigger threat to public health. It's, it's, it's not, I mean, we saw that with, with, with breast cancer and bone marrow transplant, right? It's sort of a paradigmatic example. Right. And it seems to me that we can solve the financial challenges of um, raising the money if it were simply a question of getting drugs for people. It seems to me that this much more, this, this tension, this, this rip out your insides threat challenge to me is if the only way we're going to find out whether it works is to say no to some people. That's, I mean, that's more the Ebola context where it seems so challenging. Um, so, yes, I completely agree, and I didn't talk about that at all simply because there were so many things I had to yeah, No, 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 I'm, 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 my, my but, point's not to criticize. But, um, Typically what drug companies do around this area while the, um, the, the, the application's in process, they have a pretty good idea that it's going to go through and they're starting to prepare for their launch. Companies frequently open something called uh, expand, um, Early Access Program, EAP. Um, and anyone who is, you know, like you have cystic fibrosis, it looks like the drug's going to be available. And so the company goes ahead and opens up this EAP. Your doctor applies and says, you know, I have a cystic fibrosis patient. They would really benefit from getting the drug now as opposed to like eight months later, can we do it? And the company more or less says yes. It's all free um, because, again, there are a number of issues with charging for, a, for an unapproved drug. 
And there are a number of people right now who are advocating. They're saying, forget compassionate use. Just open up the EAPs earlier yeah. and earlier mm -hmm. and earlier. And that gets exactly into what you're talking about, about siphoning demand away from um, the trials. And in fact, in one case, uh, multiple dystrophy, they did do that. They opened the EAP for this particular drug very early, and then they couldn't get people to enroll in the phase three trial because the phase three trial was against the placebo. Mm -hmm. And people were like, hmm, enroll in a placebo-controlled trial or go into an EAP where I get free drug. <laughs> but I mean, the, the trade-off of that is they were getting free drug that we hadn't tested in the phase three to know for sure that it was. Sure. All right, thank you. We probably do have to stop.